Hello and welcome to Indian Standard Time. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan and joining me today is Professor Robert Rosner, theoretical physicist, an important voice in the American Scientific Academy. You've been associated with the Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, and what we will be talking about with you today is the state of nuclear, the state of the nuclear debate, nuclear energy in the United States. Uh, as you know, uh, India is on uh, a rapid expansion path as far as uh, nuclear, civil nuclear energy is concerned, following the uh, landmark India-US civil nuclear agreement, which opened the door to nuclear commerce here. And uh, this is an area where obviously there's a lot of public, uh, there are misgivings. Uh, there are uh, differences of perception between the government and the atomic establishment on the one hand, and communities where nuclear reactors are going to be located. So I would like to draw on your expertise as a theoretical physicist and as somebody who has watched uh, nuclear developments over the last 30, 40 years to shed some light and help our viewers understand. So let, let me start by asking you a question that many people in India often wonder about. That uh, We've seen over the last decade the U.S. government and U.S. companies very bullish on nuclear power as an energy source, as a clean energy source for countries like India and for other countries around the world. But there does seem to be uh, 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 the impression that the US, as far as its domestic energy uh, situation is concerned, has moved away from nuclear energy over the last four decades. Is this a correct perception or is, is, uh, is the United States rediscovering the virtues of nuclear power? Um, well, first let me say that I'm extremely pleased to be here and uh, have this chat with you. Um, I think the answer uh, is a, a complicated answer. Um, certainly, the United States has not moved away from nuclear power. And what I mean by that specifically is that if you ask uh, what fraction of the total uh, electricity production uh, uh, in the United States is uh, due to nuclear power, the answer is it's remained roughly constant over time, around 20%. And given the fact that the total production has increased with time, that means that the nuclear share has also increased, the amount of power produced. But that uh, increase in nuclear power has not occurred by building more plants. It has increased by making the plants more efficient. The availability uh, of uh, power availability for nuclear plants in the, uh, in the US in the 1970s was somewhere around 60 to 70 percent. Today it's over 90 percent. And so there's been a real change That's the, in the, the plant load factor, the capacity utilization. Capacity, okay. what's sometimes called the capacity factor. Okay. And uh, it's increased because of greater attention to things like preventive maintenance, uh, uh, a, a certain consolidation in the industry where you no longer have utilities that only have a single plant, but have, uh, manage uh, fleets of plants. And so the overall process of uh, nuclear power management has just uh, improved enormously and it's ca causes substantial increase the amount of nuclear power. Now, it is the case that um, uh, no, uh, for a long time, no new nuclear plants were, were built. Currently, five plants are under construction. One, uh, a plant that had actually stopped construction uh, in the 80s is now being finished, and four new plants, two in Georgia and uh, two in uh, South Carolina. And you might ask, why is that? Uh, it has to do with uh, two facts. Uh, one is, um, something pe that's peculiar, an aspect that's peculiar to nuclear power, different from all other, essentially all other uh, uh, sources of power, um, which is that uh, the primary component, uh, uh, cost component, when you compute how much are you going to pay for the electricity, what's called the levelized cost of uh, electricity, turns out to be the capital construction cost. How much does it cost to build it? Uh, the cost of fuel, for example, in the case of nuclear power, is a tiny fraction. The running costs. The, uh, yeah. the, the operating yeah, costs, including cost. provision of the fuel, is a yeah. tiny fraction. Uh, sometimes it is said that the cost of uh, dealing with the waste, nuclear waste, is a large, is a big factor. It turns out to be absolutely tiny in terms of the actual cost of electricity. Uh, and the problem in the states is that the utilities tend to be rather small corporations. When I compare them with, for example, the Indian example uh, or the European example. So, uh, the European utilities, Electricité uh, de France, for example, or Aon, are very large companies. The American companies are actually quite small, and so they actually tend to be undercapitalized from the point of view of paying upfront for the construction costs of these plants. 
a, a key a important element here has been uh, that, that made this change that we, we used to buy, uh, build uh, at a, ra a rather rapid pace in the 70s and 80s is that the uh, electricity market in the United States has been largely deregulated except for a few states and it is in those states where it has not been deregulated like, out, like for example Georgia and South Carolina where the building is going on. Okay. In the, com in the commercial markets, where, the, where electricity is basically a market, in a market economy, the problem has been that um, uh, uh, nuclear plants are in competition with other energy sources, and in particular with the use of natural gas to uh, power extremely efficient thermal plants. And because of the shale revolution in the United States, it's been extremely difficult for nuclear to actually be competitive in those states where the electricity market has been deregulated. Right. So, so, the, so this brings me to the question of, of costs. I mean, right. obviously you mentioned you mentioned uh, high startup or capital right. fixed fixed costs, right. low running low operating costs in terms of fuel. Right. Um, compared to other sources of energy, mm -hmm. how how much of I mean, how efficient is nuclear? Does it purely depend on what energy energy sources are locally available? Is that, I mean, in a country like India, say, where there is no shale mm -hmm. gas and where natural gas right. availability is not so high, uh, that alters the economics of nuclear power, in your right. view? Yeah? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, what, what you just said is absolutely the case. Uh, one, one thing that uh, makes the, the, the discussion so difficult in the public realm is that uh, the costing rules for nuclear tend to be rather different than for other energy technologies. And what I mean specifically by that is the following. That in the case of nuclear, because of concerns, for example, about the nuclear waste, when you compute the, the cost of electricity, meaning how, mu how much do you pay per kilowatt hour, for example, uh, the full life of cycle costs are actually included. So you, in your electricity bill, if, you're, if your power comes from a nuclear plant in the States, you're paying for not only the capital construction costs of the plant, that is, you're amortizing the cost of the plant, uh, but you're also paying for uh, the uh, cost of dealing with the waste. You're also dealing with the cost of eventually dismantling uh, the plant. All these costs are actually bundled into the price Wait, of electricity. So, so, so the decommissioning or the Decommission entombing or whatever process All is, that is, used, included, is factored in? All that is included is factored into the cost. Uh, whereas, for example, let's say coal, uh, uh, which is actually currently still the dominant energy source in the United States for, uh, for electricity production. There, uh, those costs are not included. The, the, the cost, the, you, of course, you amortize the cost of the plant, which is cheaper than a uh, nuclear plant. You, uh, you, of course, pay for the fuel, but you do not pay, for example, the fact that uh, release of CO2 is causing damage. Yes. That damage is not accounted for. Right. You're not paying for... Uh, the fact that there are uh, these slack heaps that are uh, uh, put in retention ponds that, uh, that uh, the operators then walk away from. Right. Uh, you're not paying for the decommissioning of the coal plants. Right. Those costs are not included. So you're saying that even though the per kilowatt price of nuclear energy may appear on a bare comparison right. with other sources to be quite high, uh, it reflects true costs in a way that other sources of energies are not being... That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Right. right. So it's a bit unusual, and one can understand why this is, because yeah. uh, uh, I think the Indian public is not unusual in having concerns yeah. about nuclear power. The right. same issues uh, worry the public in Europe, in, right. uh, in the United States, North America, uh, in the rest of Asia. Right. Absolutely. Uh, critics of uh, nuclear power, uh, and they exist in the U.S., exist here throughout the world, uh, say that uh, we still don't have a sense of the true costs involved in contain in, 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 in uh, securing, you know, uh, spent fuel or the nuclear mm -hmm. waste right. in terms of even decommissioning of plants. Are there examples right. where plants have been decommissioned and Absolutely. there is a sense of costs that could be yes. uh, ascribed yes. to that? Yes. So first of all, there are specific examples in the United States uh, where plants were decommissioned. Those costs are well understood. Um, the, the, the question of what you actually do with, this, uh, with the uh, spent fuel is a difficult one, right. uh, and it's been difficult everywhere in the world. Uh, there are a few examples now of countries where the issue has finally come to the point of decision and but action. It, but in the U.S., this is still controversial. It, Yucca, Yucca Mountain remains a, who knows? a distant dream. <laughs> well, <laughs> who knows? I, I would say who knows. Yeah. But uh, I, uh, as a counterpoint, I would uh, point out uh, um, Sweden. Uh, Sweden uh, is a country that 
uses absolutely no fossil fuel for electricity production. Roughly speaking, their electricity production is split between uh, hydro and nuclear, roughly speaking 50-50. And within the last three or four years, they've had a very open, transparent process of selecting a site uh, for disposal. Uh, they, their, uh, their choice for the nuclear fuel cycle is what's called once through, that is, the material goes into a light water reactor. When it comes out, it's not, uh, uh, it, it's, it, it's not regarded as a resource. It's deposed off. And they decided to do deep geologic uh, disposal. And there, were actually, there was actually a competition, literal competition, between two sites. Both of them wanted to be the site of the, uh, the repository. Right. Both of them were sites where there were existing nuclear plants. So the local population was comfortable with, uh, with radiation issues. Right. And it turns out one of them won, and they were enthusiastic. There was a wonderful, uh, uh, you can go to YouTube and look at the, the announcement and see the happy uh, smile on the mayor of the town that won. If we take a long view uh, mm -hmm. of technology and its evolution, mm -hmm. uh, we are presumably at a point in time where solar, wind, other kinds of renewable technologies are likely to see great development. Right. Uh, how wise would it then be for a country like India to embark today upon billions and billions of dollars of investment in nuclear when uh, revolutions in solar technology may be around the corner perhaps in five or ten years? Uh, would you advise that a, that a country like India wait and watch rather than overcommit to nuclear today? No, I would not. Okay. Why that? And well, why? here's the reason. So, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the utility industry is peculiar in one, uh, and different from all other, in, uh, other industries in one specific sense, which is that uh, typically the consumer goes to a light switch and flips the light switch and expects the power to be there. And when the power is not there, uh, the consumer gets very upset. Uh, this is an issue everywhere in the world. Right. So utilities tend to be the providers of the electricity, they tend to be extremely conservative about their future outlook. That is, they will tend to bet on things that they know will happen as opposed to depend on guesses about technology development. Okay. Now, the two kinds of technology development one has to be clear about. One is uh, dealing with technology that's in the engineering realm, where basically you're dealing with, with, uh, uh, with uh, technologies where the basic physics and chemistry is understood, uh, and it's simply an engineering challenge to make it efficient mm. and, and inexpensive. Um, there are other technologies where you're waiting for, some might say, a miracle or a, a scientific discovery. And of course, predicting discoveries is a bit chancy. So what am I talking about? Well, for example, uh, fusion. Fusion is always, the, the, the wags say, yeah. 50 years in the future. So, we so fusion is in the realm of the miraculous. Right. But surely... So let's, so let's do solar and wind. Yeah. Okay, what about then? So the production itself, I think, is definitely in the engineering realm. Where, uh, both, both of these technologies, it's been very clear, have been on a declining cost curve. Uh, solar especially, it's been quite dramatic. So you might ask, so what is the problem? The problem is that both of them are intermittent sources of electricity. Okay. And, uh, so they don't help in base load? They don't help base load. They have, they're not this, what is called dispatchable. Okay. Okay? So there is a solution to that, um, and it means grid storage. Right. And that is where the technology is missing. The technology that's missing is batteries that are sufficiently effective in terms of the capacity and sufficiently inexpensive right. to actually be, be able to, and that is not just an engineering issue. store on a massive scale, actually. Right, that's, yeah, the yeah. that's the key. That's the key. And there, it's not just engineering, but it's also science. And so that, that is the problem. And so, and so that puts storage at that capacity in the realm of the miraculous as it, of now? I, I, well, the, I, I, my, my colleagues in the, in the storage field would probably not like <laughs> me to say that, but I think yeah. there is something missing. Yes, right. we don't know how to do it. Right. Now, now, one unknown fa element which we got a very nasty reminder of uh, when Fukushima happened mm -hmm. is the question of safety. Right. Uh, you can have an excellent design, great, right. great engineering. Right. Uh, you could have factored in all the costs. Right. And then you have one incident like Fukushima, right. which completely upsets all your calculations and costs. Right. Uh, is what happened at Fukushima a freak incident or are there systemic lessons that uh, the operators of nuclear plants could learn 
manufacturers of nuclear equipment could learn so that right. the likelihood of another incident of this kind is even more remote? So, uh, so this question always comes up uh, with nuclear. And um, my take is that um, uh, what has happened over the past two decades is that uh, the, the industry has, from the technical point, point of view, uh, matured enormously. It's a very mature industry. This is not a new technology. Well, uh, but where the sticking point is, has to do with human factors, has to do with human performance. And the, the example I want to give that everyone is familiar with, not everybody's familiar with nuclear plant operation, uh, but uh, I think everyone is familiar with um, the aircraft industry. Many of us fly. Uh, both industries, the, the, the aircraft industry, including the, uh, 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 the, the companies that actually fly the airplanes, as well as the nuclear industry, face a similar re a regulatory burden, that is there are government agencies that control their behavior yes. and regulate their, their safety issues. Uh, they have a public that is constantly looking at them. Uh, people fly airplanes, they care about whether or not they work or not. And in both cases, um, uh, a lack of performance, a serious accident causes public perception problems that affect their business case. So uh, the example I always lo love to give of how the aircraft industry uh, has dealt with this is at the beginning of the jet age, uh, de Havilland um, uh, produced the very first uh, jet plane, the Comet. And the Comet had an inconvenient problem. The problem was that a few of their planes would disintegrate in flight. The fuselage would simply fall apart. Not great for the aircraft <laughs> industry. To put it in my uh, <laughs> Yeah. Um, the, uh, in the US, um, uh, Lockheed uh, produced a plane called the Electra. Some of your listeners might, uh, uh, might remember them. The Lockheed was a turboprop, and it had another inconvenient problem. The wings would fall off. So you can imagine uh, a public that, uh, when they get on the airplane, cont continues to look out the window to check whether or not the, the, windows are, the wings are still attached. This might be a problem for the business. In both cases, the industry responded to the problem. There was, it turns out there was a technical issue. It was fatigue cracking. Uh, it, that problem was solved. And the combination of the industry plus the regulatory body ensured that whenever issues like that came up, that they would be dealt with openly and immediately. There are many examples that, uh, uh, of the sort uh, in the US. Uh, you might remember about 15, close to 20 years ago, uh, there was a, uh, a flight from uh, Hawaii uh, to the mainland where it was a, I believe, a, a 737, where the, the uh, door opened. The, yeah. not the door opened, but the top of the fuselage right. fell off, right. okay? So you had passengers that would be looking up at the sky if they're sitting, uh, you know, in the middle of the plane. Luckily enough, the fuselage, it held intact, but obviously it's a very scary thing. And there was a clear problem. It turns out there's a mounting problem with, uh, uh, with, the, with the, 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 uh, the devices that held the right. place together. It was, it, and it was admitted right from the beginning that there was a problem. It was addressed and solved. Uh, the same issues can be dealt with in the, and on, oh, oh, by the way, here we're talking about now technology uh, improvements mm -hmm. and the regulatory body. Um, one of the things that happened in the aircraft industry is that there was a, a, a continued process of automating the process of flying planes. Uh, your viewers might, might, might be aware that uh, in many cases, uh, the pilots actually only really engage with the plane, right. fly the plane on takeoff and landing. Uh, there was a classic... But, 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 yeah, sorry, well, So, so uh, there was a very fa famous recent case, Air France plane from, uh, 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 from Brazil to Paris uh, that uh, crashed into the Atlantic. Atlantic. Why did it do that? Because it turns out the, the uh, two uh, instruments that were measuring the airspeed disagreed, the readings disagreed. The pilots didn't, couldn't deal with this, and they actually uh, behaved improperly. They, they actually caused the crash. They, the, the, the plane was telling, the automation was telling them the plane was stalling, and they did the wrong thing. Instead of uh, nose down and gaining speed, they had nose up and lost speed, and this plane simply fell like a rock. So here had a case where technology was designed to make the plane safer, right. And it was human performance that failed. Right. And I think in the nuclear industry, that is where we are. If you look at the reports of the various bodies that looked at Fukushima, it's very clear that it wasn't 
technology that was the problem. It was human response that was but the, the problem. The design as well. I mean, the, the, the location of the backup power, for example. Um, there were GE people who were pointing out some of these things in the 70s. So, so, so there were, absolutely, there were limitations. But uh, the, the, here's the key thing that, that uh, where performance, human performance mattered. Um, uh, the incident where there was a total station blackout uh, could have stopped at the level of simply flooding the reactor vessels with seawater early on. Uh, that didn't happen. Why did it not happen? Because um, executives of TEPCO in uh, Tokyo told the uh, on-site engineer not to do this because they were interested in maintaining, they thought they could save the Save reactors. Bucks. Okay. In fact, that, that engineer, in my view, is a huge hero because eventually you realize that if you didn't flood it, you'd have really a large release. Unfortunately, that happened after the hydrogen explosion. He did flood and he was almost fired. So there was a, there was a problem, in, a right. social problem right. there, right. which is that in, this, in TEPCO, there was a mis the, 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 the communication channel back up from the ground up to the higher levels right. was simply broken. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, the, the difference between the airline or the airliner and the reactor analogy would be that you know, the airline industry could take one, two, perhaps 10 or 20 accidents right. on its chin. Right. The nuclear industry can't simply because of the, of the scale. Right. Uh, Japan has not restarted any of its, oper uh, any of its uh, nuclear right. facilities right. after Fukushima. Right. Germany will, has moved away completely from right. nuclear. Uh, so at the end of the day, um, public perceptions are what matter, I suppose. Absolutely. And, and, and the idea that uh, you know, one entered this sector with a certain sense of costs and benefits, and then you have a $20 billion or a $30 billion or some say even a $100 billion cleanup cost right. because if Fukushima alters right. the, the equation completely. Right. And, and, I, and I suppose this is something which the industry has to find, has to address in some way, this perception. Um, I'm not sure whether this can be done at the level of engineering and science or at the level of uh, communication. I think it has to do at the level of training. Right. And it has to do at the level of taking into account uh, social customs, social conditions. Right. Uh, Japan has a particular uh, corporate culture that in, in this particular case was detrimental to the safety of the plant. Right. And, that, and I think that's widely understood now. Right. I think uh, we, there are plenty of other issues that we could have covered, yeah. uh, liability and so on, which are of enormous concern to right. India. I suppose the lesson from, from Japan is that the corporate and bureaucratic culture did not help, but in fact exacerbated the problem. And as, exactly. we, as we in India move towards uh, an expansion of nuclear energy, uh, the state of our bureaucratic and right. institutional culture is something that we really need to look I, at. I would just want to add that... Uh, that uh, I think for, for many, uh, many uh, folks here in uh, India, uh, the fact that uh, there's this constant questioning and the, 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 the struggle um, is viewed as a negative. Actually, in this particular case, it's a huge positive. In Japan, you have much less of that. The fact that you have, uh, you have a questioning culture here, this is part of the cul Indian culture here, is hugely helpful to maintaining a, a, a safe nuclear industry. And I, I think you are very lucky to have that. Right. On that note, Professor Rosner, thank you very much for joining us on Indian Standard Time. My pleasure. That's it on this episode. Do join us again next week with another guest, another IST. Thank you for watching.